And Rick Bennett is here with me instead of being at General Conference. <laughs> That's right. Say, <laughs> so, oh, what is this day? Except for October actually, second. It's not over. It, it ended a half hour at ago. Two, so I'm okay. At two o'clock on Saturday afternoon, when the rest of Mormondom is listening to General Conference. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. One of the things that attracted Pentecostal scholar Dr. Christopher Thomas to the Book of Mormon were the many evidences he found of speaking in tongues. Did you know that Mormon speaking in tongues predates the Pentecostal movement by about 80 years? How did that get into the Book of Mormon? Chris really wants to talk about that, and it's going to be a fun conversation. You won't want to miss. Check it out. And then I was really interested in... You know, John Turner's biography, he talked about how Brigham Young, um, how often he spoke in tongues, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, and um, I, I, I'd given a talk to the religious education faculty yesterday, and uh, I got a couple of questions on speaking in tongues, and they, and they said, well, what would you say to LDS folk about you know, speaking in tongues? And I said, read the freaking Book of Mormon. That's what, <laughs> that's what, I, would, that's what I would say. Right? I said, I know you're embarrassed that Pentecostals speak in tongues, and we're embarrassed that it's in the Book of Mormon. So, okay, so there we are. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> because that's another big thing that you've noticed is... Um, is speaking in tongues is really prevalent and you know in my interview with Mark my first interview with Mark Staker um, he believes that uh, speaking in tongues started with a, a former slave Black mm -hmm. Pete in 1830 1831 uh, he was baptized in December of 1830 and and, and soon happened thereafter um, and for those of you who don't, who didn't follow that interview, why not? First of all, I know it was early though. <laughs> I know the sound is bad, but anyway. Um, but um, the the funny thing about it was, Joseph Smith came to Kirtland, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too on board with this speaking in tongues thing." And then some missionaries from Kirtland baptized this guy from Vermont. Some of you may have heard of him, Brigham Young. <laughs> Brigham comes to Kirtland, starts speaking in tongues. He's a white guy. Oh, it's okay now. It's a, a white guy's doing it. Um, and so, uh, and so, it's interesting. And Mark, the thing that blew me away in that interview was, he said that was the first time he's ever found any speaking in tongues, and it predates the Pentecostal movement by 70, 80 years, something like that. Um, and I know that's something that has really attracted your study. Can you, can you tell us more about that? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, there are these, it's not uncommon to have people say this group or that group, tongue speech, was present. But in the, in the cases that I've tried to track down, the evidence is all pretty meager. Right, it may, they, and sometimes it just seems to be one off. Sometimes it seems to be pretty random. I have a PhD student who wrote a book, or uh, his published his thesis, called "Toward a Pentecostal Theology of Glossolalia," and he has this extensive appendix that documents the occurrence of people speaking in tongues from the New Testament forward. And, and, and the LDS tradition makes it in that in that survey. What's what's really interesting to me is that not only do you have tongues mentioned so often in the Book of Mormon, and you know you look at Moroni and, and the description of what a, a church service ought to be, you know, uh, but the Book of Mormon the Book of Mormon makes a connection, a kind of a theological connection between baptism of fire and spirit on the one hand and speaking in tongues. Now as far as I know, and I'm not a church historian, nobody makes that connection like that in before 1830. That will become kind of a cardinal doctrine of Pentecostals when the Pentecostal revival takes place between 1900 and 1906. Right. So I'm kind of wondering, well, where does that come from? 
So, I mean, it's one thing to say Smith may run hot and cold on, um, on tongues, but, I mean, it's all over the Book of Mormon, right, which says something. And then, then Brigham's, Brigham's continuing practice. You know, the whole, uh, I, I don't know the history very well, but the whole phenomenon of having this real kind of strong, prophetic leadership on the one hand and then having this real democratized thing at the local level right that's always that tension I always kind of wonder how it got resolved and and Mike McKay or Mike McKay, McKay you know study in England run me on McKay McKay um, Mike's book on prophetic authority really helped kind of start to address that uh, because you you have in in LDS thought certainly this idea about the restoration of all the gifts right uh, you got it in the Book of Mormon um, it, it's interesting the way that gets kind of how it evolves or how it develops in terms of what is and is not allowed in the worship services does it go underground, so to speak? You know, there are all these stories about general authorities and others who had people in their lives that, you know, spoke in tongues and gave an interpretation. And, and so, you know, it, 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 I, I suppose just looking at the, the, the Book of Mormon, the way the Church of Jesus Christ uh, turned out, you know, the, the Bickerton kind of branch, is kind of what I expected recipients of the Book of Mormon would look like, where all of that kind of charismatic um, manifestation continues in worship services. I was a bit surprised at my first sacrament meeting. <laughs> you know, I'm strapped in, fullness of all the gifts. You're talking about the LDS sacrament meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fullness of all the gifts. I'm ready, strapped in. Let's go. I'm Pentecostal. It wasn't exactly what I expected. <laughs> now, have you been to a Bicker tonight service? Uh, I have. I have not. I have. Um, I have seen some videos, uh -huh. and uh, know, of course, Daniel Stone uh, pretty right. well. And I, you know, I don't know if I knew of Daniel through your interview. Or if I had um, learned of him earlier, but I, you know, I, I learned a lot, and then we spent some time together, uh, kind of ex exploring all of those aspects. <laughs> well, I know Steve Pineacre. He attended a Bicker Tonight service in right, Florida, right. and he said I felt right at home. <laughs> right, that's right. And and, uh, and and in what I've seen, there are a lot of commonalities with Pentecostal worship. Uh -huh. Which would probably make both groups nervous, right? <laughs> but um, I'd met with a guy, oh, let me see if I can remember his name, back when I was writing the book. So this would have been pre 16. I think his name's Richard Lawson, who met with me from, from the Church of Jesus Christ. And we talked about how often the gifts manifest in, in public worship. And I said, well, for example, how, how often in a month would I hear somebody speaking in tongues? And he said, probably every other Sunday, which oh, wow. is not insignificant, you know. And so, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff about that. And, of course, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormon is the only thing they accept out of this, the broader Smith corpus. Right. Right. Which makes me wonder, you know, if there's some kind of continuum in that regard is the more you buy in likely are you less likely to have those kinds of charismatic manifestations in your worship well and that's interesting because i remember i talked with uh, a guy named randy sheldon at the temple lot church they're the uh, they're called the church of christ yeah and um he told me that uh, they do have speaking in tongues in their denomination as well. He says it's it's pretty rare. I think Daniel told me he thought it was pretty rare too. Um, but uh, but he 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 had seen it happen, um, and just coincidentally they don't they don't accept the doctrine and covenants mm -hmm. either. But they do accept the Book of Commandments. Right. And so um, they've reprinted that now. Is and that and the 1833 ish? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Right. And so I remember talking to him, and he said, now you follow along in your Section 20, and I'm going to read this, and you're going to see the changes. <laughs> and I had just interviewed Dan Vogel, and I was like, oh, yeah, Dan would be all over this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, and, and, of course, I don't know the broader tradition well enough to know of any other you know, things to compare it with. You know, I know um, I, there was a Sunstone interview with Bill Russell from the Community of Christ, mm -hmm. and they... Um, really believe in the gift of prophecy. In a lot of ways, I, f I found some similarities. It does seem like, um, I mean, I know in the LDS Church, we still we still believe in the gift of prophecy, but it seems like it's different now. Um, Bill told a story about, uh, you know, basically somebody in the congregation having a revelation right there, and I'm going to call you on a mission right here. And I know to some degree in the LDS Church, you know, that you hear stories about Brigham Young and General Conference where somebody sitting in the audience is like, I'm going to call you, Brother Joe Smith, or whatever your name is, um, on a mission right now. Get your wagon ready. You're leaving, you know, in three days or something. Um, but you don't... You don't see that happen mm. anymore. I mean, I, I, I can't think of an experience like that. Um, and, you know, that's kind of... So I don't know. Uh, that, that's not exactly tongue speech. But, but this whole idea of prophecy and of revelation, I, I, I think it seems like that's really what draws you to Mormonism um, because that's, that's very Pentecostal, um, charismatic type of, of thing that happens. Yeah, I sometimes say that, uh, you know, that I saw this interview with George Harrison, and uh, he was talking about when he first picked up an Indian sitar, uh -huh. and he said, it just felt familiar to me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of how, how the early LDS history felt, it just felt familiar. I was reading that section of Moroni, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what, what we're up to. So... So yeah, I mean, the, the, my interest is really much more on that end of the of the tradition. So, so the Book of Mormon is very Pentecostal. Is that a good way to say it's it? It's got Pentecostal themes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and and of course, you know, there there are other groups that f focused on gifts. I mean, Alexander Campbell, you right. know, one of the great critics of of um, of the church or the Book of Mormon. There. Their gift, folks. Uh, so it's not like you know it's it's completely. Uh, it, it's not like it's unique, but yeah, I mean uh, that that was very familiar to me. That whole that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Christopher Thomas. In our next conversation, we'll talk about how Book of Mormon theology fits within mainstream Christianity. I think his answer may surprise you. Well, it's, you know, aside from, um, aside from the fall and aside from um, Jesus appearing so often so early, uh, the Book of Mormon's pretty kind of Protestant, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, I think Campbell was right about all the kind of theological scores it settles, right? If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents, and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just look, click the yellow subscribe button, and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. 
get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospel tangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.